Oh. <laughs> Hello. You know when uh, in movies characters will go up to a mirror in the bathroom and they'll be like, oh, and they'll put water in their hands and go, ah, like that? There's actually a sciencey reason behind that. Why that's refreshing or feels like it's changing how you're breathing, maybe calm down a little bit. It's called the mammalian diving reflex and it has been found in every air breathing vertebrate to date. And what, uh, what it does is when any part of the face or nostrils are wetted, the body immediately diverts oxygen or where the oxygen is going in your body the most to critical internal organs and it kind of prepares your body to be submerged under the water. And what it has in effect is a calming effect. Try it. Go splash water on your face right now. I'll wait. Ah, right? Because my show. Wait, then that'd be because because science. You know why? Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments and questions and corrections, and I enact my my evil plan to incentivize all of you watching to find all of my flaws in exchange for mentions. It's not stressful, we're learning. So let's get right to it. On the last episode of Because Science, I said that the Death Star has another fatal flaw, not just the exhaust port that we saw in all of the movies and the core, but one that is very subtle. I said that if the Death Star fired its super laser, bleh, because light does not have mass, but it has momentum, that amount of momentum from a super laser bleh would fling the Death Star backwards so fast that it would turn everyone on board into goo. But what did goo have to say? Probably some gurgling noise. Our first comment comes from Diego Sanchez who says, what if it wasn't a laser though? Bleh. What if the Death Star throws antimatter directly so half of the energy is already on the planet and also the mass would be less so the binding energy would be smaller? Uh, why not use antimatter as a weapon? Well, there's a problem. Canonically, the Death Star's super laser is a super laser. So, so it's a, a laser, but as someone who doesn't agree with when Star Wars calls something a laser, I'll let that one slide. But the problem with antimatter weapons that I don't think is ever really talked about is that if you brought matter and antimatter in direct contact with each other, how would you do it? You would touch the two things together, right? But right when that happened, the first immediate contact, there would be an antimatter annihilation, which would release energy according to E equals MC squared. And these two blobs of matter, one with a different charge, would immediately blast itself apart and away from each other. So unless you somehow found a way to perfectly mix and react all of the antimatter with all of the matter instantaneously, you wouldn't get as much bang for your buck. If you just threw a glob of antimatter on a planet, it would go like, <laughs> like that. So I think in this case, a super laser isn't the worst idea. Even if it's not a laser, antimatter is probably a lot messier. You know what the Empire likes? Cleanliness? No. Our next comment comes from Aiden Orr and Rad Spacker Wolfbane. Oh, sorry. Rad Spacker Wolfbane. Who say, comparison, the, the literally the exact same thing. Comparison Ford as a pun, shaking my head. What, you got a problem with my puns? Well, I'm sorry, not sorry. I hope this doesn't create a fissure between us. But what are you gonna do? Vader's gonna vape. <laughs> okay, that one was pretty bad. Our next comment comes from the Natundi and others who say, well, if there's a recoil problem from firing one laser in one direction, nope, learn my lesson, then why not just fire two lasers in opposite directions so that the Death Star at the center doesn't move? Um, well, aside from being a tremendous waste of energy, I suppose you could destroy two targets at once, and if both lasers were coming directly from the core, 
then the Death Star wouldn't move. But you'd still be putting tremendous forces on the structure of the Death Star, which I didn't get into. But when you have accelerations that take you from zero to many kilometers per second, dozens of kilometers per second in just a few seconds, I don't know if there's any structure to the Death Star that could handle this kind of pushing and pulling. And everyone on board is already scared. And where's all the heat go? Heat's a problem in space, as we've talked about before. And if you have one super laser firing two beams, would be even worse, then you'd have two exhaust ports, and then you have twice the, the potential for teens to mess up your plans. Pfft, millennials, right? I'm a millennial, technically. I'm a millennial falcon. Ho! Pretty good. Our next comment comes from Jack Lindy, who says, Kyle, you already got one thing wrong in the first 30 seconds. Darth Vader would never have force choked you for bringing up the flaws in the Death Star. To be honest, he didn't even like it. And he mentioned in the first part of episode four with the quote, don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the force. He only went along with it because it was one of the Emperor's projects. nerd. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. So I see you take issue with my narrative interpretation of what was happening in an educational video. To that I say, too bad. Our next comment comes from Moogle X, who says, so is there a less powerful version that you could use that would render the planet destroyed, either just killing all the people or rendering it uninhabitable that would allow the Death Star to be plausible? Yeah, the recoil problem is such a problem because they state that it can destroy, well, because they demonstrate that it could destroy an entire planet in one shot. That takes a lot of energy, but in reality, you wouldn't have to destroy the planet if you just wanted to destroy all the rebels on a planet. I mean, we can destroy all life on a planet right now just with the number of nuclear weapons that we have. Oh, the Empire could just drop their trash from orbit and that would probably have enough kinetic energy to wipe out a small rebel base. So yes, you're absolutely right. The Death Star is overkill, but it's named the Death Star. It better be most impressive. That's a Star Trek reference. The Last Jedi isn't even a movie. Shut up. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Michaela Engelbrecht, who says, Kyle, quick question. In The Phantom Menace, we learn that Anakin, AKA Vader, thanks, <laughs> had no father, and it is said that he was conceived by the Force itself. Assuming that the human biology and genetics still apply in Star Wars, how is Anakin male? Michaela goes on to say, if there's no male chromosome in Shmi's body, then how could the Force use her body to conceive a boy? Well, you're right. All versions of Immaculate Conception are pretty messy. <laughs> Ironic. But if you ask me to science it, some humans or humanoids, let's just say Shmi is a human, can be chimeras by which I mean they have more than one set of genetic blueprints inside of all of their cells, or some of their cells. So, for example, twins, one of the twins can be absorbed by another in the womb, and then that twin will have two sets of DNA inside of some of their cells. There was one case of a mother who was getting a maternity test and they took DNA from her blood cells. That DNA did not match her children's DNA, so they said, oh, you cannot be the mother. But then they took DNA from another part of her body and it did match. So she had different genetic blueprints depending on which cells you were looking at. So maybe Shmi, had some absorption of another twin in the womb when she was born, and she has some male genetics inside of some of her cells that the Force could manipulate and make her pregnant with. It all sounds kind of weird, but the Force works in mysterious ways. I think that's what they say. Or it's a lazy plot device.
Oh, so congratulations, Michaela Engelbrecht. You are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> oh man, that that one should have came with doves. <laughs> there it is. Sorry. But of course, I'm not always right. I just shined a laser pointer in one of my eyes, and that was stupid. So what else did I get wrong today, slash this week, slash last week, slash whenever the episode went up? Last week. Our first correction comes from frequent commenter Michael Birthlesson, who says, assuming universal density for a planet that is the same density all the way through is counter to everything we know about planet formation. You're absolutely right. A planet is not the same density all the way through. It is denser in the core than it is at the crust, but the equation that we used is a very good approximation instead of having to go through all of the complicated calculus and take into account the density at every different meter of a planet like the Earth. And if you do that, the difference between the approximated binding energy of the Earth and the binding energy if you calculate the different densities all the way down is the difference of 2.2 times 10 to the 32 joules and 2.4 times 10 to the 32 joules. So although you are correct, I do not think it is a big enough difference to invalidate our conclusions. Oh. I'm not doing so hot. Maybe it was the laser. Our next correction comes from Dennis TE number 80 on Twitter, who says, in your latest Death Star episode, your equation ends in a velocity 100 kilometers per second, but you miss the seconds, and then you transfer it to G's, which is acceleration. Just a minor flaw, but a crucial one indeed. I hope my proton torpedo hit your thermal exhaust port. Well, jumping right over that weird euphemism you just used, I went back and checked, and not only did I include kilometers per second, but I clearly said that the change in velocity occurs over five seconds. That's the firing time. And a change in velocity over a change in time is indeed acceleration, which if you divide that acceleration by the acceleration due to Earth's gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second per second, then you get the relative unit g's. And all of that is in there. So, you missed. You should have turned off your targeting computer. Nice try. Our next correction comes from a couple of people, but Paulie Patterson points it out. <laughs> says, does the lasers coming to a point before they fire out from the Death Star, does that make any sort of difference in terms of recoil? Well, the immediate problem is that if the lasers stopped at a point in space, redirected themselves, and then fired again, that violates the conservation of momentum, which is a universal law. As long as the galaxy far, far away is operating in the physical universe as we know it, lasers can't really do that. And God so loved uh, 24, commenter a couple of episodes ago points this out. The lasers would go through each other as they tried to focus, bing, 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 and they wouldn't combine and fire out as a single laser. That's not how light works. But Star Wars seems to have a thing for lasers that can touch and bump into each other, like laser swords. So kind of internally consistent in the Star Wars universe, but not physically consistent with the universe universe. Mmm, mmm, tasty universes. Oh, na, 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 na. I'm Galactus. Our next correction comes from dead body without any identification, John Doe, who says, I love your video, but you didn't see that the Death Star isn't standing still. It's moving forward in the direction of its laser incredibly fast. I mean, I don't remember it doing that, but sure, why not? I don't know how fast exactly, but based on how quickly stars in the back background, background disappear behind the Death Star, it must be going really, really fast, so the damage from recoil is basically period gone, period. Mmm, I'm thirsty because, well, actually, you're incorrect, sir. Um, Acceleration is always a problem no matter what velocity you are traveling at. If you are going forwards at, say, 100 kilometers per second really, really fast, like you stated, and then you fire the Death Star super laser, which would fling you backwards at around 100 kilometers per second, you are still decelerating. You are still changing your velocity over time. And though it would bring the Death Star to zero, 
velocity in this example, you'd still decelerate down from 100 kilometers per second to zero in five seconds, and you'd still pull negative Gs. So this is the tyranny of spaceflight. You still have to deal with the consequences of acceleration, no matter what velocity you want to reach. Everyone would still pace to catch up Gooify. Think about it like this. If you were on a train going as fast as a cannonball moves, and you were sitting at the back of that train inside of a cannon, and you fired yourself out of a cannon, you would land on the ground perfectly still. But you'd still be accelerating inside of the barrel of a cannon, and you'd still... I mean, not like the people who fire themselves out of a cannon, but they're not going as fast as a cannonball. They're going as fast as, like, you can run. Like, cannonball run. Our next correction comes from a few people, but Fran Olmsford and Doth Platypus say, doesn't artificial gravity come into play here? If the Death Star has some hand-wavy artificial gravity generation, wouldn't that dampen the recoil? Mm. Oh, I'm still thirsty because, well, actually, no, it wouldn't. If you're talking about a simple conservation of momentum problem, momentum is mass times velocity. So mass is what's important. Though weights can change on the surface of different planets, for example, masses do not change. Even though you are weightless in space, you still have the same mass. So even if you gave yourself some more weight by increasing some kind of artificial gravity, you'd still have the same mass, which would still give you the same momentum if you got some velocity somehow. So no, artificial gravity would not save the Death Star in this case. It would have to become more massive, like we were saying, by making it denser. And we can't do that, so... Engines? But then you run the risk of turning the whole Death Star into a pancake, so. But the nerdiest correction this week, I'm giving to Ruiman90, who says this. Am I the only one who thinks that an exhaust port isn't a huge flaw? If you tell me that I have to fly to a giant space station, evade turrets, defend myself against other thousands of ships, launch two torpedoes that have to do a 90 degree turn into a two by two meter entrance, and those have to go in a straight line for 60 kilometers fighting whatever the exhaust port expelling gas, radiation, heat, sewage, or whatever while the station is moving, I would say that is impossible. What do you think I am? A space wizard? And as you would see, a space wizard wizard had to do it. Yeah, I mean, when you lay it all like, out like that, it sounds pretty hard to do. Yes, good correction. It seems harder than it sounds. So, Ruiman90, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you already saw it. You saw it two days earlier than everyone else, and you got to see other content that I do, like Natural Selection, and you can only vote on that debate show if you go to Alpha, and you can get other premium content. <laughs> But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is gonna be, can the Hulk jump into space? Can the Hulk jump into space? That's how he would say it. That's right, Hulk is gonna smash in this week's episode, not like that, in this week's episode of <laughs> Because Science, because we're gonna try to take decades worth of ridiculous feats of strength in comic books and focus it into one Earth escaping leap to see if Banner can really bound into the beyond. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, and leave me all your comments, questions, and corrections at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Hey, and also, do you know that I'm a huge Magic the Gathering nerd? Well, if you want to see me play that very nerdy game, you can go check me out on the Command Zone on YouTube, where I play an awesome game of Commander, and you can also go check me out on Geek and Sundry's Spell Slingers, where I play a game of Standard. It's Magic Christmas, but with me. And hey, don't forget. Don't wait until you get some arbitrary moving goalpost of success before you feel like you're a success. If you're doing something passionately and, uh, and, and decisively and with the goal of becoming better and bettering yourself, you are doing that thing. You are an artist. You are a scientist. You're an engineer. What have you. You're doing it already. And you can do it.